Hello, everyone. I have a mic gooseneck that won't mind. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium of the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Tomorrow, starting at 5 p.m., we're having a History Happy Hour remix with Chef Nick Wallace. In addition to the cash bar, there'll be food trucks and music on the plaza out front. Then at 6 p.m., Nick Wallace will talk with Cindy Ayers Elliott, owner of Footprint Farms, LaMarcus Robinson, owner of Oops All Vegan Restaurant, and LeBron Alexander, executive chef at Blue Cross Blue Shield Mississippi. So join us for that if you are able. The pandemic put on hold the Medgar Wiley Evers Lecture Series for the last several years. We are excited to see it return Thursday, April 28th, with Moss Point native and Princeton University professor Eddie Glaude Jr. His most recent book is the New York Times bestseller, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and Its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. The Evers Lecture will take place at 6 p.m. here in the Nielsen Auditorium. Admission is free and no tickets are needed. Finally, I hope that you will join us next Wednesday for History's Lunch when Katie Mills, director of the Museum of the Mississippi Delta, and Irma Hale will discuss the life of Irma's father, the Greenville native artist Reuben Hale. We're grateful to our partners, the Mississippi Humanities Council, for co-sponsoring today's History's Lunch as part of their Speakers Bureau. You'll find evaluation forms strategically placed by the cookies. Please fill one out and leave it anywhere. Thomas Michael Kirsten's presentation today is Communes and Counterculture in the Magnolia State. Kirsten is Associate Professor of Sociology at Jackson State University, a retired Army Medical Service Corps officer. He earned his BA in Sociology from Arkansas Tech University, his MS in Sociology from, Ar uh, from the University of Central Arkansas, and his PhD in Sociology from Mississippi State University. Kirsten's first book, Where Misfits Fit, Counterculture and Influence in the Ozarks was published by the University Press of Mississippi and won the Mid-South Sociological Association's Stanford M. Lyman Distinguished Book Award in 2021. As a teenager, Tom lived in a commune in the Arkansas Ozarks. Help me welcome Tom Kirsten. Thank you. I thought I got my britches stuck on the uh, chair there. That would have been an embarrassment. Um, anyway, I, uh, I'm very honored to be here, and I, uh, I don't like being behind a podium, so I'll be right here. Anyway, um, I, as was said by Chris, I, I am a ch hippie child, and so I did wear a little patchouli today, and so uh, just want you to be aware of that. And we talked about Al Stewart and the Year of the Cat, which is the only song that I'm aware of that where they actually sing about patchouli, I dare you to find something else. But one of the reasons why I'm doing this is that a lot of people, and people got, you know, uh, challenge you about your bona fides and whatnot, is to let you know that you don't have to do that with me. I am a hippie kid who lived in a commune. Um, and, and if we're past that, I think what we need to do is kind of band our wagons together and talk about a, uh, a diversified past that is not ever talked about. And I'll challenge any of you to tell me if you and your history classes in high school have ever, ever encountered any of these things that I talked about today. Uh, so if you have, I will be floored because I, I deal with all sorts of age groups and none of them barely can tell me what a commune is. And I don't even use that word. But anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Um, and there's my contact information for you if you need it. Now, the other thing is, yes, I was a hippie kid, and you can see this picture of me. Uh, I moved to the Ozarks uh, from various places. My father was in the military, and I think it's good to give you a little bit of context about why I'm interested in doing these things. And yes, definitely, there's my bona fides. Look, that's a hippie kid. Uh, so anyway, the point of it is, there were no, because people ask you, well, where did you live? Where did you live? And I told them, well, if you could 
if you count trees, I lived by these types of trees and those types of trees in the Ozarks, um, and there was nothing else. It was the uh, Ozark National Forest. And so much of the time I had was spending reading and uh, doing things like that and hiking through the woods. And so uh, I didn't have much in terms of social graces and whatnot, uh, and I was extremely shy, as you can kind of see with that picture there. And uh, our time in a commune was short-lived, and it was very, very hard. And a lot, of, a lot of times when people think of communal living, they think of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it was not, well, of course, I wasn't going to get anything anyway, but there was nothing going on except hard, hard work and personalities that wouldn't sync up with each other and lots of hurt feelings and all sorts of stuff. This is a step above people saying, well, we need to affect positive change in society. This was actually doing it. And so this is another thing that I find interesting when we're talking about these, is that these people are moving past saying, well, they need to do this or that. They're actually doing it. So it becomes a laboratory for a sociologist like me to kind of explore this, to see what's going on here. And of course, when we're looking at these things, my father and I read B.F. Skinner's Walden II. I don't know if any of you uh, read that, but it, when you read it, you say, you say to yourself, oh my God, operant conditioning, we can do that. And then when you get out into the real world, you really can't because we're not pigeons. Um, and so we read all sorts of things like that. We read the Whole Earth uh, catalog and all numbers of things, and we found out we were grossly ill-prepared. And we came up into the Ozarks in the uh, winter of 78, and it was a major, major snowstorm at that point, and we were kind of caravanning around the Ozark Mountains, up into them. And it was my first time ever being introduced to sulfur water. How horrible. How horrible was that? And then when we ended up in several families in old Chevy vans, listening to Bob Seger on eight tracks endlessly as we're going from Texas to the Ozarks, we ended up in one cabin, all these families, strays, and uh, our family, in this one rough-hewn cabin that had only tar paper and newspapers on the inside to keep the weather out. No running water, and uh, I became the water boy. Uh, so we had a well, and that was an extremely hard life, and I was embarrassed by it. We were very poor. One year, I think we made even less back then, less than $1,000. So even back then, this is bad, less than $1,000 for that year. And so it was a horrible life uh, to, to try to get through the winter. There was one time I almost had frostbite. Uh, it would rain inside the house a lot on us because we were up near the roof on the loft. And so <clears throat> my, my experiences were not very romantic. You know, I didn't have romantic um, nostalgia for this at all. But I realized that this is a story that needs to be told, and this is a story, especially in the South, where we think of everything is monolithic, it's always been one way, and it hasn't. There is a whole story, set of stories that need to be explored, need to be exposed, and I think it'll uh, allow us to understand and greatly appreciate, appreciate that there's a diversity of experience and uh, ideas out here in the South. Oh, I should say one more thing. As I moved to Mississippi, so as I'm making my progression further south, and I'm hoping at some point to end in Margaritaville, that uh, that some point uh, when I hit Mississippi, I had misconceptions. So I had misconceptions about Arkansas before I even got there. I didn't. I, was it Arkansas or Arkansas? What is it? What's a tick? I don't know. Um, um, had no idea. And then when I hit Mississippi, I thought, Oh my God, I'm going to Mississippi. And this is when I was much older. That's that's Mississippi burning. They're going to do stuff to me. And so one of the things I love to do is kind of learn about the place and expose for uh, folks who are, you know, not, maybe not conservative, but folks who have biases against uh, the Deep South in certain ways like I did, okay? And I also want to shape uh, some of our discourse around thing, uh, people I really admire, and he, you should understand that Martin Luther King, his undergraduate background is in sociology. And so this is kind of a sociological informed theological uh, statement here. And for those of you who really can't see it, I'll just say it because it's so important for communal, uh, uh, you know, the whole communal outlook of life uh, in many ways. In a real sense, all life is interrelated, and I want us to think about it as well. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. 
And so this is a beloved community, something that Josiah Royce was talking about at the turn of the 20th century, and where we have loyalties above ourselves, above our own self-interest. And this beloved community is something I think is uh, probably the lodestar for uh, a lot of people who want to do communal efforts or even just make the world a better place, is that they want to affect that beloved community, that there's something above us that we just don't care about ourselves, okay? And so that's kind of the uh, guidance in a way. So this is another thing as well. Rosabeth, Rosabeth Moss Cantor is a sociologist I admire. And of course, of course, everything I do has to be defined. And I, you might have been asking, what is a commune? I don't usually use that word commune. I use this word right here because when you think of commune, it was what I was telling you earlier a lot of people had in their mind, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it's never really that. Uh, for real, in real life. And so we use in uh, scholars this word here, intentional community, because they intentionally create a community. If you think about other types of communities, they kind of just happen, don't they, over time? And they just kind of happen, uh, organically arise um, based on geography and uh, use of resources, things of that nature. But in this case, these types of communities arise because they have an ideal of one sort or another. And these three particular ideals are uh, the ones that I oftentimes have seen when we talk about communal uh, living, and that's first one is harmony, is how can we live in a harmonious way? Now, if you think about your own families and you think about Thanksgiving or Christmas time, you can reflect on this and how hard that might be. And then brotherhood, the idea that we can come together if we're to even di very different in theology and in various other things that divide us. And we know that's very hard as well. And then finally, just peace. If we can't have the other two, maybe we can just leave each other alone and not worry about other ch people's lives, choices, and things of that nature. Just, just live and coexist, right? Just live in peace. And we find that even now that's hard for a lot of people to do, especially let some legislators that find this one, last one hard to do. Le leave people in peace. And finally, uh, what we give as a real definition, a really uh, uh, you know, something you can put your teeth in, is that people who live together, and if I give you a number, it, it gets defied every time. So it has to be more than a couple people, but I can't really give you a number, like 5, 10, whatever. So if you ask me, is this a commune or is that a commune, and you say it has three or five people, it depends on a lot of things, so I'd have to look at it. But it has to have some people in it, and they have to uh, share their assets in some way. And then they also have a belief, some, one of these beliefs here that you see that I list above, or in some cases, it might be an economic system that they want to um, uh, perfect. For instance, a lot of communes that I'll be talking about today wanted to try socialism in the South. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. How can that happen? This is, that's, you know, that's not going to happen here. Well, so one of the earliest communal uh, experiments was in Neshoba, which is near Memphis, Tennessee, and this is Frances Fanny Wright. The reason why I bring this up is um, she was among the first and informed, and about the time that she was doing this in 1825, she had a commune, and it was called Neshoba. You see here in his picture, she's from Britain. And she had this uh, outlandish notion, so get a load of this. She had this outlandish notion that blacks and whites could live together and that women could be freer in their sexual expression. 1825, just be aware of that period of time and that it's near Memphis. They didn't last long. <laughs> didn't last long at all. And uh, a, lot of the uh, a lot of these folks that freed black men and women, um, uh, everything was thrown asunder. And she was trying to do something where they could have their own little world, where this could be, and they uh, co lived cooperatively. Uh, of course, it didn't happen. But at the same time, in 1825, you have, uh, s uh, you know, the brother of Jefferson Davis, Joseph Davis, in 1825, sitting in a stagecoat, talking to a fellow about uh, this guy's ideas about uh, communal living. And it helped him, Joseph Davis, um, uh, figure out how to organize his plantation. And I'll get to that. So a lot of uh, brilliant folks doing great things, maybe not the smartest things to do, but they were, you know, they, they were brilliant on paper at least. And so one of the first ones is Davis Bend, and what I'll tell you about Davis Bend is this is Joseph Davis's uh, experiment, and um, it was uh, actually uh, 
you know, the people who were in charge of it were Montgomery, um, Benjamin Montgomery and his son Isaiah Montgomery. Um, but Joseph uh, Davis, he thought, well, he would use Owen here, George Owen, and his ideas of cooperatives, which was about the 1820s. He's in the stagecoach listening to this fellow who's, I believe, from Scotland, um, and he's talking about how to create these cooperative uh, arrangements that uh, talk about respect and whatever, mutuality, the things that we were talking about under MLK's uh, quote there. And he was doing this at Davis Bend, and he let Montgomery, um, uh, Benjamin Montgomery, uh, run the, the uh, plantation. And actually, Benjamin Montgomery was very accomplished. And so after the war and when the slaves were freed, they took, pretty much took over the plantation, and that was going to be the model for Reconstruction if the Federalists weren't so half-hearted about following that model. And this would have probably been a much better outcome uh, is following the, uh, um, and it became Mound Bayou, just so you know. The, the final result was Mound Bayou. Any of you been to Mound Bayou? Yeah. So this is, uh, it, it's not that it didn't end, in, you know, they had an arrangement in the town of Mound Bayou, but can you imagine if Reconstruction, if they actually, if the federal uh, system had taken on this model, they wanted to, and they had some uh, uh, Union soldiers who were uh, kind of in charge of the freedmen and all that, and they thought this was a good idea, but it was er like everything else in Reconstruction, it was half-hearted. It was not really uh, going to happen. And so that's David's been, we'll talk a little bit about that. But you can see here, when we look at this, and this is why this table is here, that there's a spread. It's nothing like the Ozarks. And so when you compare this to the Ozarks, the Ozarks have, you know, scores and scores and scores of communal arrangements going on throughout the years. But there is enough that we should be proud and we should be able to talk about it a little bit, okay? So I'm going to, some of these, I'm not going to be able to tell you much about them, and they may not even exist much uh, anymore. But uh, that's where we can have a conversation after my talk a little bit. And then this is a geography a little bit of this. So if you see it right down below, and I know that people uh, on streaming on the, on the um, uh, Facebook won't see the laser, so I won't do that. But anyway, when you look at here, you'll see Fairhope, and Fairhope is going to be the hub for pretty much all communal activity for Mississippi, for a good part of Mississippi and some other states as well, and I'll uh, let you in on some of the things that were really cool about Fairhope. Grand Rage Colony, down at the Gulf there, and you got Davis Bend right there, you can see where that's going on, pretty much in the bend of the Mississippi, that's where they were. And New Mississippi Social Socialist, uh, that was a press, but... Whenever you had a really a press, you usually had a, a, a gaggle of people with that press, and they were usually living together. And you see that with Kudzu, which would be in Jackson in the late 60s, early 70s. And then Wall Hill, a lot of people don't realize that Wall Hill was a single-tax colony and that it was informed and supported to some extent by Fairhope. And uh, it, it was there up in the 30s, 1930s. And then Ruskin about the same time as Grander Age Colony, and that was a socialist colony, as was Grander Age. So a lot more than you might, again, have any of you heard some of this stuff in your history classes in high school? Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, Benjamin Montgomery here, it's a picture of him, and he pretty much took over after the war and uh, organized his his family, the set of families that were on that, that were formerly slave families and whatnot. Now, the thing about Jefferson Davis and also Joseph Davis is, if uh, on a scale of how awful they were about with uh, dealing with their slaves, um, they were a little more enlightened about how to treat them. So they weren't a, they weren't going to make a, a far leap towards George Owen or Owenism, um, mutuality, cooperation those types of things, because they, if you look at slave owners, they were kind of more um, caring about their slaves than other, other slaveholders, which is ironic and wrong thing to say and all that, but, you know, it was 1860s, 1840s, 1860s. So uh, they wanted to create a black utopia there, and they, they actually went through that process and set things up along those lines. Um, and then his son, Isaiah, took over, and later on it would become Mound Bayou. And there are a number of books out there that you can read, so I'm not going to really emphasize this that much, but there are so many books out there, and if you remind me at the end, and uh, for those on Facebook, I will provide a reading list for all the things I talk about today. 
Okay? And there are plenty of books about this. And this one I spent a long time on because this is an interesting character. Uh, so this fellow uh, that you see right here, Sumner Rose, uh, he came out of the Midwest, Indiana, and that's where you find a lot of these communal folks coming uh, down to the south. In fact, uh, some have likened um, that uh, the, the communal activity that goes on in the south in the 19th century especially as uh, enclaves of northerners. And so it becomes like an island. Uh, you see the little signs, little blue, I forget it, where little blue circle, whatever. Um, but anyway, they had their little enclaves of uh, uh, northerners in these colonies. And this was a socialist colony. Sumner Rose comes out of Indiana. Now, he was a strapping young lad, and he, for me, he was thinking before this, he was a, a public, newspaper publisher, and of course they get their heads filled up with all this stuff. Before he did all that, about uh, uh, 1880s or so, he thought he could get on one of those penny, uh, the, the penny cycles, um, the one with the big front wheels, and he was going to do a cross country from Indiana to the coast of California on that. And you need to remember there weren't the highways that we have, and you can't lock your hubs on one of those penny cycles. Um, so this was a very interesting notion that he had that he was going to get on one of these big bicycles with a big front tire and do that. And he did it to a certain extent. He, he went as far, uh, uh, he didn't get to California, but he, went, he came up close to California. So he did do it. He used a lot of the railroads to, to follow the railroads uh, in that pursuit. So he was an idealistic person, and he had some ideas. He was a teetotaler, so he was, and this was a big issue, abolition, uh, when you're talking about the progressive era. And he was also of German extract, and those folks, especially when you start getting towards World War I, get looked at a bit strangely. Uh, but they were very big in Indiana and some of these Midwestern areas, these um, German extract. And that's what my family is, on the, my father's side, is this German uh, heritage. He decides at some point that he's going to go to the South and see if he can't start a socialist um, com communal uh, society, the Grander Age Colony, because he thinks that the Republicans and the Democrats can't get it together, either one. And he had flipped back and forth, like a lot of these communal folks did, from Republican to Democrat, Republican to Democrat. And at some point, he became a socialist. And one of the themes that you see as I talk about these things is that at some point, especially in the 19th century and the, uh, up to the mid of the 20th century, it was uh, more viable for someone to actually um, be in politics as a socialist than a Republican in this state. Because no one would become a Republican in this state, right? It was a democratically led state. So the only option you could have, and there were a lot of people who were uh, vying to be uh, in politics. And so he actually ran in the Gulfport area for a number of uh, political seats. And a lot of socialists did as well. And a lot of people voted for them. More so in many cases than they did for the Republicans. Now, I know that's a brain-melting thing for some of us, but and how these things flip over time, but that was kind of the situation. Um, and he also had that newspaper. And so in that, that town, he had the mouthpiece talking about socialism and the injustice. Now, the socialism he's talking about is kind of the socialism you see with MLK and some others. This is Christian socialism. And I'm not aware that when you hear a lot of the... Uh, uh, folks talking about Christianity today that they really express it in this way, but a lot of folks looking at the progressive era thought that that would be a movement towards what was to be affected on uh, this world, not another world, and that was beloved community, and that we needed to do right by Christ and all this other stuff that they would say. And so he was going to affect that change, and he had some issues with all sorts of things that we think are commonplace and acceptable now, uh, and you'll see that here in a second. He was associated with George Orr. In fact, the Coopolis, the name of his uh, uh, communal arrangement, Grander Age, uh, it, pr they produced bricks, and they had great mud. And so George Orr talked about how great the mud at Coopolis was. And then he wrote extended, wonderful, long letters to Eugene Debs. And so Eugene Debs, uh, around World War II, uh, sorry, World War I, sorry, um, well, you know, he was in prison because he, uh, back then they had sedition laws, Again, this notion that we can just make laws that are unconstitutional and no one will care uh, for things that one says 
or whatever. And so he was uh, uh, a pacifist and uh, said we should not go to war. And that threw him in jail for a long time. And so uh, Sumner Rose wrote a lot of letters to him while in jail saying, you are great and wonderful, and once you get out, we, we can do great and wonderful things. The other person here that you see is F. Allen Cowell, and he was with the Ruskin colonies. They broke away. And I think one of the reasons why F. Allen Cowell broke away from Sumner Rose, besides he thought Sumner Rose was a bore, he was, uh, too ideological, was he thought he could get in, uh, I don't know how to put it this in any other way, with the Ruskin colonies, especially the ones up in uh, Tennessee that you saw, and I talked about uh, this with uh, uh, Neshoba, but the Ruskin colonies as well, the socialist colonies, they were very freer in their sexual expression. And maybe the action down in Gulfport wasn't as much as it was up in Tennessee. And so they talk about that a little bit, about, the, uh, you know, when you see Summer Rose writing about this stuff and, uh, to his Fairhope friends, uh, he tells them this guy's a scoundrel of the lowest order and, you know, he's run off to run. Uh, he, he tried to whip up all sorts of things here in grander age and he's up there in Ruskin causing troubles as well. And it just, to me, it was like a page out of any communal handbook. We, we had that fight. 100 million times, and even in my own example, we, we, we fought those fights. And that's a picture of him right there. Respectful looking guy, isn't he? There's a picture of it, Coopolis, how it laid out. And uh, they had a, a headmaster, they had all sorts of folks, and they, were, they also had subscriptions to the, uh, uh, their uh, newspaper. And they were linked up with Fairhope. Fairhope and they both went to the Ozarks first to try to scope out some land in the Ozarks. Couldn't find anything, I guess, that they wanted. And they ended both up on the coast, one in Mississippi and one in Alabama. And Fairhope, just so you know, still has some of that single tax stuff going on. Okay? So they figure high, uh, highly in this um, looking at communal activity in the South, and especially Mississippi and Alabama. And also theosophy, if some of you were interested in that. So when you look at Sumner Rose, he had an issue with capitalism, um, and one of them was uh, rents, rent, and then usury. Now, I don't know if you've really looked closely into the Bible about the actually, uh, you know, when we think of uh, this, and in Islam, they really are very strongly uh, focused in on uh, making money off of loaning other people money and how bad that is. And so you can see some of this stuff, people, uh, devil here, and what you see is this... Uh, fat cat with gold, and there was this issue of bimetallism and gold, uh, keep uh, the wealth from the people and whatnot, and then you have taxes there, and then a monopoly dragon over here, and usury over there, anarchy over into the corner, all this stuff, and this is in the banner, in the banner, in the masthead of each copy of the Grander Age Colony newspaper, and this was that philosophy, is we need to do away with that, and share things collectively. Now, when you think about that, that sounds great on paper, but at they, in some cases, as you'll see as we move along from one thing to the next, that's hard to do. People like their stuff. Yeah, they like their stuff, but hear about usury, where people make money off of loaning other people money with uh, especially insane uh, uh, interest rates, that was seen as evil, even in Christianity. Somehow that got changed for some point, and now it's not seen as evil. You may see it as evil as I do as we're having to suffer through it, but the people doing that don't. And so I guess they saw the little red words in a different way than most other people in the uh, New Testament. And so this is another one here, uh, Christianity and Socialism. And uh, here you can see the banner that Christ is holding. Of course, he doesn't look like what we think Christ might look like. Love, justice, and equality, kind of like Martin Luther King was talking about. And again, this is that social gospel and how can we affect not in another world. That's a cop-out to these folks. They say, yeah, you have to die, who cares? No one's there to document that. It's on this planet at this time, how you affect change that helps people and makes them happy. And so that was the whole point of social gospel. And it wasn't only people who lived in communes. It swept through the nation, and this became the basis of what we know as the progressive era. Lots of things happened in the progressive era. So we're talking 1890s, 1900s, and around that time, before World War I, where we kind of lost our, we kind of lost our way a little bit after that. Included in many references to the Bible, as you can see, and as you look at these and other types of things, they talk about the Bible. They know their Bible. They know it very well. And so you, are probably, you probably do get a sense of people can talk about the Bible, and I heard that the devil can talk about the Bible just as well as anyone else. But in this case, they actually know what they're talking about. 
and they know what's in those little red words in the New Testament. And they talk about how money is not a master, nor working man a slave. And that was what they were trying to perfect in this world. You look at Fairhope, and Fairhope is the hub of all this activity. And again, it starts about the same time, a year later actually, than Grander Age Colony. And they were both, this one's a little bit different, because Grander Age is kind of socialistic. And Fairhope is not really socialistic, except in this case, you may have heard of single tax colonies. And single tax colonies are in which if you make something off the land, you do not get taxed or uh, uh, something taken out of the thing that you create. But if you use it off that land, you pay a rent for the land or you, 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 there's some type of payment uh, collectively for the use of that land. That's it. No other taxes. No other thing. And so a lot of these places even shared equipment shared buildings and things of that nature. And then they would all collectively in some way pay a, uh, for the, using that parcel of land, and that was it. That's all they had to do. Now, if you think about all the taxes you have to pay now, and I don't know how they do it given that they have state tax, federal taxes, and whatnot, but this was a, a radical thing to do, that say, okay, the only thing you have to pay is just the use of the land. That's it. That's all you have to pay. And so you started to see springing up across the United States all these single tax colonies. And the hub of all that activity really comes out of fair hope for many of those places. And so I want to uh, stop here a second and uh, do a tip of the hat for these folks because they also inspired Wall Hill or helped a fellow that we'll talk about, Abe Waldauer, who was a big uh, single taxer out of Memphis. And he and they talked a lot. And then they had conferences and conventions of George uh, Owen and all these other folks and talking about single tax colonies. They had all this literature as well. And it was a big thing. Again, Progressive Era had all these things going on. And people were like, you know, this is, they, they had uh, a bad economy at about that time. We're looking at the Spanish American War come, uh, coming up and all those things. And it's the turn of the century, too. So every time you have a turn of the century, things just go weird. I don't know if any of you remember when it was supposed to turn into the 2000s, and we thought, oh, my God, the computers are going to blow up and the robot people are going to come and get us. Um, but the same kind of thing, and it inspires communal activity. When you look at it, the communal activity uh, reaches a, a pitched fever during these rollovers. These, and also times of crisis, you start to see uh, communal uh, uh, arrangements across any place. Uh, in San Madrid's uh, uh, earthquake um, in uh, around Memphis area caused communal fervor and also millennialist um, religious expression to peak. So yeah, lots of crazy stuff going on in the 1890s. But you're looking around here at this one, um, and you know, Grander Age had fallen and reemerged in the early 1900s. They uh, had problems with the newspaper being a thing that would be mailed, and the newspaper uh, postmaster general didn't like what was going on, and people in power didn't like what these folks were writing about. So they started censoring this stuff and keep trying to keep the newspapers, and they would put uh, new uh, rates on how, how much money that would, you'd have to pay to get this newspaper out. And it killed off in a big way some of these underground newspapers. And this was an underground newspaper, just so you know. Uh, and so was the Grander Age Colonies newspaper. Uh, underground newspapers, we tend to think of them something out of the 60s or 70s, but there were a whole slew of them across the nation in the 18, all the way from the 1870s, uh, 80s on up. And some of them were German and uh, foreign as well. And so there was that element going on too. These are different. And another element when you talk about underground or these isms is it was seen as abolitionists. So that's one reason why it didn't take on to the same level as it did in the Northeast, some of these movements. But it did take on to a certain extent. And this one here is a new Mississippi socialist in Kill Michael. And I don't know if any of you ever been to Kill Michael. Have any of you been to Kill Michael? Did you know that there was a socialist newspaper down there? And they ran that guy all over the place. I mean, they ran him from one little two-by-four place to another little two-by-four place, burned down his press from one place to the next, all around Kill Michael, Winona, and on and on and on. And I don't have any information except what is in some of the newspapers, and they did not like him. They did not like him one bit. But he was kind of the face, one of the faces of the socialists of this time period who were getting a lot of votes. 
And so behind him were all these other folks, people who were uh, politicians of one sort or another. Um, uh, what I mean by that is that they were living in all various different places in Mississippi, and many of them were socialists. And he became kind of, his paper became that mouthpiece for the socialist movement that was going on in Mississippi, a movement that was vibrant, much smaller than anything the Democratic Party had. But the Democratic Party had machine on things. And so it was easier to elect a socialist than it was to, to elect a Republican in many counties and areas. Wrap your head around that. Yeah, so I don't know much about what happened to him afterwards, and it's kind of interesting. So uh, for my archivist friends and things of that nature, uh, I can uh, sit with you at some point, and maybe you have something, I don't. But uh, I think that was intentional, and to some extent, just wipe this person away, make sure that people don't have a history. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this, is trying to re-expose us to that history that existed. Now, for Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal administration, many of them are part of the social gospel as well from the 1890s, and they want to affect progressive change too. And uh, some of you might have heard of uh, Delta uh, Farm and also, uh, what is it, Delta and uh, I forget the other one, Providence. Providence. Do you, you know who Will Campbell is, any of you? Will Campbell, he wrote a book about Providence. And so what you find here is that uh, this is a kind of top to bottom as, as opposed to what I've been talking about, where it's uh, grassroots building of communal activity. This one is interesting in the sense that the, it's coming from FDR uh, and lots of people in his administration who uh, are part of the social gospel and wanting to affect progress in a way. And this was a cooperative arrangement. You can see these houses. On one side are African-American and on the other side are uh, Caucasian. But what they're doing is cooperative living, and they're actually respecting each other to a certain extent at some point. And I think one of the problems is that the people in the surrounding community got tired of that. It's never really, for these types of things, it's never really what they're up to is that people want to, you know, they don't, they, they're worried. They're worried about that change. And so you can see Will Campbell in his book here, if you're interested in these things. But some of these pictures that you have, you can get from the uh, archives, Library of Congress archives, and they're just amazing. And this existed, and not only here in Mississippi, but in Arkansas and other places around the Delta, in which they were going to take these poor folks and have them live uh, in a cooperative arrangement. Uh, now, if you think of sharecroppers, you think of the company store and all that stuff, right, and how you couldn't get out of that cycle. This was much different than that, okay? They owned together that land, or actually the government did, and, but they were on that land, and they could actually uh, shape their own destiny. Whereas if you're in a sharecropping environment, the only thing you can shape is, well, I don't know what you can shape. I, I need to stop that metaphor there. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so there's around that same period of time, we're talking New Deal, but a little bit before and around there, you got, because um, it's 35 for the New Deal, but here in 32, up in Wall Hill, which is near Memphis, it's near Memphis, and you have this well-to-do guy out of Vicksburg originally, well-to-do Jewish fellow out of Vicksburg originally. He goes up to Memphis, and he's a World War I vet. He comes from a well-to-do family, and he has this question. He says, well, what do we do with all the World War I, II vets, World War I vets, I'm sorry, and uh, that are not employed and just without any way to uh, affect uh, a good life. And he said, well, what we can do, because he was uh, looking at Henry George's stuff too, and if I said George Owen, I was mistaken, it's Henry George, uh, single tax. Um, we can use this philosophy from Henry George, and we can create a place like Fairhope up in this area called Wall Hill, which is near Memphis. And what we'll do is we'll put these World War I veterans on it. They'll till the land. Whatever they produce on the land is theirs to keep, make money on. However, we're not going to tax that. We'll have a flat rate of 6% of the land value, um, and that's the only thing they'll have to pay. And they also provided the vehicles and the, the houses that were there for them to use. That sounds like a good deal. It sounds like a real good deal, right? And so the thing of it is, I can't find anything more than what was going on in 1932. I suppose it's like any communal uh, endeavor, like the ones I was involved in. That's a lot of hard work, even if you got everything set up in that fashion. It's a lot of hard work. And some of these folks coming in were not used to all that hard work of uh, tilling the land and you know live by the crop, die the, by the crop type of idea. 
Um, and so this was a, a, I don't have any evidence that it existed very long, but it did exist for a time. And um, as we move on into the 60s, because the, the uh, New Deal uh, places like Providence and uh, some of those other communal areas, they lasted until 1956, and then they just petered away. Um, and the government kind of uh, fell down and let things kind of break, break apart. Here we have something called a Poor People's Cooperative, Liberty House. And some of you may be aware of that, and in fact this facility has some materials from Liberty House. Uh, and I would encourage you to go and take a look at that. I believe they're that way. And so you'll see some of these materials. And Doris Derby, who passed away here in the last few weeks, I've been working with her on an online exhibit of her, some of her last photographs that she wanted to have shown. And so uh, that's something that I and the Mississippi Humanities Council are doing. Uh, they gave me a grant to do that. And so one of the things is I wanted to look at this type of communal arrangement, which is really dealing with cooperatives, and it's African-American, which is amazingly uh, rare because usually for African-Americans, much progress and effecting of change happens within mainstream, their mainstream church. They don't go outside of the mainstream society usually to affect change like you see in all these other things. Um, so the church is where most of what we talked about, these communal arrangements, the church that they belong to is where they seek to better their lives. In this case, what they wanted to do with Jesse Morris here and Doris Derby and some others is create some of these craft cooperatives and teach people how to make leather works, candles, and all this other stuff across the state of Mississippi. And those products would come to a central place in Jackson called Liberty House. And then that Liberty House would sell them, in, and uh, it was in Jackson, sell them there, and then had a catalog, a little bit of a catalog that they could sell uh, through the mail. And then they would also have Liberty Houses in Greenwich, clerked by Abby Hoffman, for some of you who didn't know. So these, these things come together in very interesting ways, don't they? And so these various places were, uh, so you look at these, uh, not Liberty Houses, but the craft cooperatives themselves, usually it was older women. And this was the first time they could make more money than being a domestic servant. And that really ticked off some people, especially white women. They did not like that. Uh, but it, they didn't really uh, get dissolved because of that reason. They just never had a business sense. I hate to say it. So the, the business side of running a um, uh, business, uh, you know, like a cooperative here. Uh, Jesse Morris uh, had a great idea, and he said, basically, we need to self-determine, uh, teach people how to make money on their own. So instead of those highfalutin ideas that you heard earlier, some of those, he was saying, teach people, like, show them how to fish, and then they can make their own money. And then they did do that, and they, but it broke down because of business practices and a failure to get uh, goods and money out to those craft cooperatives and vice versa. The, the craft, craft cooperatives started to have fights between the older folks making things and the younger folks who were m making things. Uh, lots of problems. But while it lasted, there were Liberty Houses across the nation that were selling all these goods. And then Doris Derby would uh, speak at various places to try to get these goods that were being made. And we call it primitive stuff right now, primitive arts and whatever, right? Uh, but they didn't really do that back then. No matter what, they didn't care what you called it as long as it sold and that money got back to Mississippi into those cooperatives. And that was the whole point of it. They were more about action and making things happen than highfalutin words. But you have to have business acumen. And so this is one of the things, and when Doris Derby was talking with me about this, one of the things that really stuck with me about what they were producing, and that is when you think about uh, a little black girl, little black kids, they didn't, and she mentioned this to me, they didn't really have dolls like, that would kind of look like them that they can uh, say, be proud of. And that she was quite proud of the work they were doing because they were making these dolls in which uh, children, black children can instead uh, pick up that doll and say, this kind of is me instead of just a white doll that was kind of the, the baseline, always the baseline. But they were making these things. And then, of course, they were doing other things, making dashikis and whatnot, uh, trying to build up black pride through craft work. And it worked for a certain while. They lasted you know, 60, about 65 through the early 70s. Yeah, but again, the business model was not really, they didn't have business people, to tell the truth, to make it last. 
And then also I should mention there were a lot of people trying to uh, stop it as well. We're getting close to the end here. But anyway, here's another one. And this is Edge City. These are the folks who created Kudzu. And the Kudzu newspaper, it's an underground newspaper. How many of you have ever heard of the Kudzu newspaper? Okay, I have a copy here. I'm going to donate to the... uh, uh, archives today, uh, an actual copy. But the point of it is, Kudzu had David Doggett as one of the editors, but they also lived together in around this area, Gallatin Street. And, and you can kind of see with red dots where a lot of their folks and their influencers and their board of uh, the board of directors and whatnot, all the people associated with the Kudzu and all that stuff, they lived. And it's near, you know, it's near Jackson, but on West Capitol Street and Medgar Evers and around that area. And so. Um, kind of interesting just to see where they, uh, you know, when you look at the demographics. Now, as you go up here and you start looking at that area, they had interlocking uh, uh, orbits with other groups. So, for instance, the Unitarians had uh, a lot of folks in their church who were also members of uh, the board of directors for Edge City. And so you had all these different groups who were helping affect change with these younger folks. And all they wanted to do, and they were harassed endlessly for the audacity of saying, hey, can we have a place to just play some rock and roll and stuff like that? Because if you look at the kudzu, it's mainly ads about rock and roll and giving ads about Oz Boutique. And so if you ever heard of Oz Boutique and some of these places like that, I remember head shops. I don't know if some of you do, but head shops were these places with uh, black light posters and whatnot. They were, some of those things were here in Jackson. Amazing. And here's a picture of it. Jackson, folks. Did you get that in high school? I'm about finished here, but one of the last ones here that I think is, again, where they're reading little red words in a uh, more literal way, and they, they think those little red words in the New Testament mean something than the, maybe the prosperity of gospel folks think, is this one that uh, they wrote the book here, and you can see the authors there, as Grace Matters. And it's an interesting book because they try to live a Christian communalistic lifestyle off the cam- near the campus of Jackson State my employer. And so when you look at these folks, one was white, one was African American, this was a radical experiment because even back then this was not really done, right? And they found out, and I read the book, it again was another thing, like this is my life when I was living in a commune too, fighting about clothing, who gets what, fighting about where you room, just fighting, a lot of fighting. And you can see that, why they're fighting, because we had one refrigerator, one telephone line, we had one common checkbook. There's going to be fighting. <laughs> There's going to be fighting, right? And so it didn't last, but you've got to give them kudos for trying, you know? And that's the whole point here. So I'm going to end with this here, just telling you where I think things are emerging. Younger folks aren't going into communes. They're not doing that. But what we are seeing, and the communal folks that are in those uh, arrangements, uh, there's a place called Common Ground in Alabama, those folks are getting old, and so they're wondering who's going to take over. Sad thing is, maybe it's a cycle, and again, if things cycle to where it gets really bad, folks start looking to alternative arrangements of living. That's always a possibility. But here on these last three, what you might see is co-housing, where we live together in a co-house type of arrangement, and we share like a common kitchen, uh, laundry room, things like that. And then cooperatives, a big time in Alabama, going to Birmingham and Montgomery, they had cooperative arrangements where people lived in like uh, in, the, in the towns near the universities, they lived in uh, these houses, these big old houses. And can you imagine that? All these folks living in that, but they, uh, those were cooperatives. And I talk about that in some stuff I've written, the cooperatives of Alabama. And then Echo Villages, how do we live smartly? And I know that there was a past talker, uh, 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 Mr. Callender, who talked about smart growth and all that stuff, Echo Villages. And that is the direction because, as we know, The uh, climate is not changing for the good, and we can live smartly, and actually a little more traditionally like we did. We usually grew up, not out, so sprawl was an abnormality, not uh, normality, and so we may have to go back to the old way of doing things. And with that, I am finished, and (laughs) any questions? I think we have time for questions. If anyone has one, raise your hand and we'll let you ask it. Dear Payne comes through. I am interested in the connection between Davis Bend and Mount Bayou. Being from Vicksburg, uh, 
Davis Bend, south of Vicksburg, Mount Bayou, further into the Mississippi Delta. But I love you made the connection between Joseph Davis, Benjamin Montgomery, mm -hmm. and then Isaiah Montgomery, who started Mount Bayou and continues to this day. Yeah. Thank you for that. I did not know that. Well, it's, it's in the book. <laughs> or in the book. <laughs> Read the books, folks. They are good books. I'm telling you what, they have good books about uh, Mount Bayou and this stuff here, and they have good books about Fairhope. There are a number of good books about these things, and I, as I promised, I will give you a reading list. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I don't have a question. There's a fellow back here. Thank you. I had understood, correct me if I'm wrong about this, that Fairhope, Alabama, started as a refuge for white people uh, just as people saw that the Civil War was coming on and they thought, oh, the world's going to come to an end. We've got to have a place where the white people can be safe. Is that how Fairhope started? I'm not familiar with that. I can't deny it. But what I can tell you, the Fairhope I know and the books that are dealing with it, Gaskin and other folks who've written about Fairhope, the founders talk about single tax colonies. But what you mentioned about uh, a refuge against a coming apocalyptic thing is a common notion that a lot of communes started back at that time. Uh, for instance, I forget the name of one, but there was one in the Ozarks. They thought the Protestants and the Catholics were going to end up fighting and blow up the world. Well, not blow it up, but there wouldn't be any of them. So they were going to create one in the Ozarks. And so they tried to hire out 100 spinsters with their spinning wheels to create clothes for this this place. So there were a lot of communal folks that were freaking out about the end times and whatnot, but I don't think that's the case for Fairhope. Uh, I should tell you all that this, this and other things I'm doing are going to be leading up to a book about counterculture and communal activity in the Deep South, a follow-on from Misfits. So um, just, there's a reason why I'm doing all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, thank you for doing this. I um, really appreciate it. Like you said, there's not much attention shown to it. I have a personal interest in the underground or counterculture newsletter, newspapers from those days, and I was wondering if you've come across any published works, summations on them. Uh, some I'm thinking that I worked on personally, Great Speckled Bird in Atlanta, Kudzu, mm -hmm. Undercurrents in Lafayette, and I forget the one in New Orleans. Um. There's a speckled, uh, yeah, the nor, I forgot the, now since you forgot it, because since it's contagious, your forgetfulness and mine now. Um, New Orleans had a big one. Uh, the thing of that, they were all together, and they were part of the student um, uh, writing movement, which I forget the name of that at the moment. I'm not that, I'm, I'm old, but not that old. Uh, the point of it is, there are some summations of this, these, the underground newspaper, Street Meyer comes to mind, but I'll put that in a uh, bibliography for you. And then uh, something a little more hopeful is, there are online archives with the actual underground newspapers that they have in their repository. I think it's out of University of Michigan, and I'll provide that link as well. So you can actually, you, well, you know, you do it with your hands like this, but really it's with a mouse, right? <laughs> we have a comment and a question from the live stream. Janet Shanks says, uh, I worked at Oz Boutique and the Granary Macrobiotic, went to Unitarian Church, Edge City, Red Kudzu. A lot has changed since the early 70s. And then... Uh, Sarah Campbell asks, where did you find Summer Rose's letters? Summer Rose's what? Letters. Letters. Uh, well, so a lot of those were published, and uh, they were available. I think there's a museum, or no, I'm sorry, a library down on the Gulf Coast. And, they, you know, it's serendipitous. A lot of my research was serendipitous. And so, you know, I was frustrated. I couldn't find a lot. I found a lot of newspaper stuff about Summer Rose. And then somehow or other, it came to be this librarian thank God for librarians, uh, this librarian somehow came into my life and said, oh, by the way, we've got these letters that were published that he wrote to Fair, the Fairhope folks about his grievances with his own folks and why you know, uh, Grand Rage broke up. And so some of those letters were made available through that library, and I forget the name of it as a matter of fact, but I want to thank that librarian for offering those letters. Many times letters are not saved, but in those cases they were published, and uh, you get to see some of the dynamics. And my God, what a load you get when you see that stuff. That's where I told you about uh, the fellow that moved up to Ruskin, uh, came out of those letters. I need to know the lady beforehand. I need to know her. I need to talk to her. <laughs> so if she, if she hears this, please, i got to talk to you. I am doing a lot of work on, yeah. You know her? I am doing a lot of work about counterculture and food. Counterculture and food. So I have um, um, 
a presentation I did that people liked about that as well. And I am looking at you know macrobiotics and those types of things in Jackson in the early 70s. Macrobiotics. Uh, I, I'm interested in uh, who is Jesse Morris, and my, my, the why I'm interested is I worked with some sociologists at Alcorn State many years ago, and I just wonder if there was any connection there. But who who is Jesse Morris? Well, he's a great, wonderful person. He was, and he uh, he was kind of the lead person for Poor People's Corporation. But he was involved with all the things you, you know about Core and all these other different groups. He was he had his hand in so many pots in this area and in, on the national scene as well. Uh, he, I mean, he was trying to bring in money and talent into Jackson, and then he was also on the flip side of it trying to train. So they used they had a, they were trying to set up a, a, a training center in Edwards. I don't know if you've been to Edwards. There's not much there. So we're trying to do all that and teach folks coming in from various places in Mississippi how to do candle making and all this other stuff. Uh, so he was the driver behind that. And, of course, the Sovereignty Commission really were hyper-focused on him and Doris Derby. So he, uh, he just was a great thinker, a person who had these ideas. And they, another part of the reason why they're great is that for many whites, it wasn't too much of a risk. If, if you understand what I mean. It wasn't like em, empowering in great ideas that overthrow the government or whatever. I don't mean great, but uh, big ideas to overthrow the government. It was basically training people how to create crafts and things like that. Something a little bit innocuous, but make money. Still, he ran into some issues. He was one of the founders of the Mississippi Food Network, I think. Yeah, so he's a great, wonderful guy. He had his hand in so many things. Like a lot of these people back in the day, just, you know, just overlapping in all sorts of orbits in a number of ways. We have another question from the live stream. Um, Al White asks, where did you find the Kill Michael paper? I guess that was the New Mississippi Socialist. <clears throat> well, from these folks here. I, I was looking in the archives one day, and I was like, holy cow, Socialist paper up in Kill Michael? There's, I didn't know there were any, there's anything up in Kill Michael but cows, you know? Um, so I, you know, I looked and saw that there. And the sad thing is, here's another thing you, you need to recognize about this paper, is they printed it, in, I believe, in red. So at, over time, when you look at the newspaper, and over time, what happens to that red? It fades and fades and goes away. And so it just everything went wrong for him. And they didn't like him. They burned his printing press. I don't know where he went. He was a, uh, from outer state, and he came in. He was a darn socialist. And that was more of a threat again than, in some cases, a Republican. And he had a lot of uh, socialist supporters in the state. One more question from the live stream. Bill Justice asks, is there a way for those of us who are on Facebook Live to get a copy of the reading list? We can uh, always post that yeah. in the comments for folks who want to see it afterwards. Now, I don't want to set myself up for failure. Give me a little bit of time, like a couple of days, OK? <laughs> I'll do that for you. Right. Other questions? Oh, uh, sorry, papers over on the tables and at the ledge. Let me say one thing before uh, we're finished, if I may, and that is, uh, again, I am writing a book about counterculture and communal efforts and things like that here in Mississippi. If you have any connections like that lady, please, uh, you now know who I am. I, I need to talk to you, and uh, I promise I'll be gentle and nice and get your story down because, as you know, the stories are dying every day. And it's a sad thing. It really is a sad thing. And I would like to get that story out there. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate you coming out today. Um, okay. Don't forget to come back tomorrow if you can for the program at 5 o'clock uh, out on the plaza. And then next week for History is Lunch. And then next Thursday for Eddie Glaude for the Evers Lecture. Um, Tom, thank you so much for this. We look forward to another program on theosophy in Mississippi at some point. You better get your grand poobah hats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Help me thank yeah. Tom for this program. There you are. There's Edge City. Yeah. And then I guess this is the best one I've seen so far, but you guys can have that. That's great. Okay. How much did these counties influence other later, uh, maybe, uh, um, radical?